thanks, Wilford, for the introduction. And uh, I'd like to thank all the IPAM staff for all the great work they're doing, keeping keeping the show running these days. And uh, of course, the organizers uh, for the opportunity to give this talk here. Uh, so I will be talking about existence theory for uh, non-separable mean field games in Sobolev spaces. So, uh, you know, the, of course, there are a lot of takes on mean field games, and uh, I'll be looking at it from the PDE viewpoint. I'll be looking at the mean field games PDE system, uh, proving an existence theorem. Uh, so there are a number of existence theorems for uh, the system, uh, very many of which make uh, heavy use of very specific structure of the nonlinearity. Uh, you know, I think we all know that the nonlinearity in the mean field games PD system is the Hamiltonian. And when I talk about structure that other people use, it's that the Hamiltonian is additively separable. And then that the parts might be the, the two parts that it separates into might be convex and monotone or things like that. Uh, instead, uh, I want to treat more general Hamiltonians that don't have structures like that. And as a result, uh, as a result of not having the structure, the, the, the theorems are maybe less comprehensive. So, uh, methods that rely on these nice structures, for example, tend to get solutions which exist for any time horizon. Uh, without using methods of convexity or whatnot, uh, I will instead have to rely on smallness conditions. So a number of papers uh, that don't rely on structure uh, might have something like an assumption that the time horizon be sufficiently small. And so I will have a condition like that. M uh, my condition will be a little more uh, general or uh, a little more flexible than just requiring the time horizon to be small, but it's in that spirit. Uh, so non-separable Hamiltonians are of interest in application. Uh, a lot of the problems uh, with nice structure, although you get nice results for them, uh, you might not see those structures in practice. Uh, and the economist Ben Mall. Uh, has some examples of problems uh, that he's interested in arising from application that are definitely non-separable. Uh, so that's the kind of thing we have in mind that uh, even if there are limitations because of the smallness conditions, we're trying to build theory that um, might apply to uh, problems arising in application. So the method that I'll use is the energy method. The energy method is well known for evolutionary PDE. Uh, here, uh, I adapt it to the forward-backward setting. So in the energy method, uh, well, I'll talk about steps of the energy method in a minute, but there is some, th some effort that needs to be made uh, to adapt it to the forward-backward setting of mean field games. So here we have the mean field games PDE system. Uh, I think everyone's familiar with this, that you have a value function U uh, related to the quantity that uh, the agents in the game are optimizing. So our equation for U is uh, backward parabolic UT equals minus epsilon U uh, plus a Hamiltonian. So the Hamiltonian is allowed to depend on time T, spatial variable X, uh, the other unknown M and the gradient of U. And I've done something funny here, which is put a uh, parameter epsilon in front of the Hamiltonian. Uh, you could have that parameter there. If you're not happy with the parameter epsilon being in front of the Hamiltonian, you could just set it to be one. Okay. So uh, this epsilon comes into part of my smallness constraints. We never have to take epsilon small, but it gives us an option later on for something which could be taken to be small. Okay, and uh, I'll try to make minimal assumptions about H. Like I said, no additive separability 
or convexity, uh, just some boundedness that you get boundedness of H and its derivatives uh, on certain function spaces. Okay, then we have the evolution equation for M, uh, M being, of course, the distribution of agents in the game. So you get MT plus the same epsilon times divergence of M times HP of T, X, M, D, U, uh, and that's forward parabolic, so that equals Laplacian of M. Uh, then we have our boundary conditions. M at time zero is M naught, and U at time capital T is the payoff function G applied to uh, the final distribution M at time capital T. Uh, for convenience, we take the spatial domain to be a d-dimensional torus. Uh, and then we want to I want to say a couple things about the payoff function. Uh, the payoff function that there are a couple layers, uh, there's kind of a hierarchy of difficulty. Uh, the simplest case is what I have written at the bottom here, that uh, G does not actually depend on the final distribution. G is just a given, uh, just a given final value function, ut. So u at time t is some ut, okay? Uh, and in the simplest case, that ut would be relatively smooth. And relatively smooth here means one derivative smoother than the initial distribution, M0. So if M0 is in HS, then we could have the final value function UT, a given value function, being in HS plus one. That's the case I'll focus on most uh, in the talk. Uh, the other two cases for G are written on the line above, that G does depend genuinely on the final distribution M at time T. Uh, and then you have the subcases that G could either be smoothing or non-smoothing. So smoothing would be that if M at time T is in the Sobolev space HS, then U at time T is in HS plus one. Uh, so you could arrive at a smoothing uh, payoff function by including a mollifier in it or something. Uh, or you could have the non-smoothing case that G just maps HS to HS. So in that case, uh, G could really just be a local function of, of M at time t. Okay, so like I said, I'll focus most on this bottom case that uh, g is trivial in the sense that the, the final value function is a given smooth function. Uh, but we are looking ahead to, to the other cases. Okay, so let me mention other works. I mentioned at the beginning that many uh, papers in the area proving existence for this PDE system uh, treat separable problems. There are a few other works treating non-separable Hamiltonian. A couple of these are my own works. Uh, in my prior works, uh, I use different function spaces, not Sobolev spaces. Those function spaces are based on the Wiener algebra, and that was inspired by uh, work in incompressible fluid dynamics by Duchamp and Robert. Uh, Duchamp and Robert proved an existence theorem for vortex sheets. And the vortex sheet problem is ill-posed. Uh, the initial value problem is ill-posed. The ill-posedness is because the vortex sheet problem is actually elliptic. And so to deal with the ellipticity, Duchamp and Robert factored the elliptic operator into a forward parabolic operator and a backward parabolic operator. And so uh, Duchamp and Robert uncovered a forward-backward structure for vortex sheets and uh, in my prior work, I applied that method for forward-backward problems for vortex sheets to non-separable mean field games. Uh, and those function spaces, again, use the Wiener algebra. So uh, spaces like Sobolev spaces or uh, Holder spaces are more common than function spaces based on the Wiener algebra. And so that's some of the motivation for, for doing the current work. Uh, so around the same time, my, my paper on uh, existence theory for non-separable non problems in Sobolev spaces appeared. Uh, a paper was put out by Sarant, Gianni, and Manucci. Uh, I think they uh, got on the archive about a month before I did with their version. Uh, they also prove an existence theorem for smoothing uh, for, for the mean field games PD system. Uh, with non-separable Hamiltonian uh, for smoothing payoff functions. They also have a condition that the initial data M0 be taken bounded away from zero. Uh, 
Uh, I think, uh, I hope I'm not mischaracterizing this, I think that's because of a change of variables that they make in the, in the, uh, in the method they use. Uh, but uh, we, uh, the, the, the theorem generally bears uh, some similarity to our theorem. Uh, I will uh, talk at the end about eliminating the assumption of being, of having a smoothing payoff function and uh, I won't have an assumption that the data be bounded away from zero. Uh, otherwise, the, 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 there are some, some similarities between the works. Uh, another, another problem uh, are mean field games with congestion effects. Uh, Gomez and Voskanyan uh, treat non uh, proof existence theory for non-separable mean field games in the congestion case. Uh, so in that case, you have your uh, probability measure M appearing in the denominator in the Hamiltonian. So it's a particular form of the Hamiltonian uh, to model that congestion. Uh, and in that case, it's natural because the M is appearing in the denominator. It's quite natural that uh, the initial distribution M not be bounded away from zero. Uh, another example I know is by uh, Graeber and Ben Susan, and I think there's another paper by Graeber and Mautzuni. They treat a very particular form of non-separable Hamiltonian uh, related to models of market competition. These are what they call Bertrand and Cournot mean field games. Uh, I think it's correct that their payoff function is non-smoothing, but the Hamiltonian, again, it has a very particular form. It is non-separable, though. So uh, I'll be looking at making existence theory for the mean field games PD system treating as general Hamiltonian as possible uh, rather than particular forms without requiring the initial distribution to be bounded away from zero and which can also treat non-smoothing payoff functions. Uh, I should say um, <clears throat> the, the requirement that the uh, distribution be bounded away from zero uh, because these are parabolic equations at any positive time you're going to get, no matter what initial distribution you start with, at any positive time you'll get uh, the distribution away from zero, but uh, it, it won't be bounded away from zero uh, naturally if it starts uh, being somewhere in zero. Okay, uh, so that's where we're going with this. And before we get into the existence proof or the statement of the theorem or anything like that, uh, I'm going to start by making a small reformulation. Uh, and my reformulation is simply to subtract the means of both of the unknowns. So we replace U with W, where W is uh, the projection of U that removes the mean. So the, uh, the spatial domain, again, is the torus. And so I can just subtract the mean of u at every time from u, and that gets me w. Same thing with m. Uh, only with m, we know what the mean is, because m is a probability distribution. Uh, I just subtract uh, the uniform distribution from m, and that gets me mu. OK? Uh, so my unknowns will be w and mu, which are the zero mean versions of u and m. And part of the motivation for that is that the mean of u doesn't affect the dynamics at all. Uh, the only thing that ever appears in the right-hand sides of the, of the equations are, is the gradient of u, and the gradient of u is the same thing as the gradient of w. So that mean doesn't affect the dynamics, and so I don't want any of the norms that I use to end up depending on that mean if, if it's not really relevant for how the solution develops. Uh, for mu, uh, the m bar, the, the, the mean of m, uh, I'm calling m bar, uh, m bar can also be viewed as the uniform distribution. Uh, that does affect the dynamics, but if I want to talk about the possibility of solutions with small data, because m is a probability distribution, it can't really be small. Uh, the, the smallness condition we have is, is not a small data condition, but it allows for the possibility of small data. And so I, I want to allow for a characterization of the data as being a small 
perturbation of the uniform distribution. Again, we don't have to have the data be a small perturbation of the uniform distribution, but I do want to allow for that as a possible source of smallness in the problem. Okay, so then we're going to prove existence of a solution for W and mu, and then after proving existence for W and mu, you can find U and M again just by adding back the means. Uh, and I'll just say a little bit more about that when the time comes. Okay, uh, I said that I'll be applying the energy method. Uh, so uh, I'll just very briefly go over the steps of the energy method. Uh, in the energy method, you introduce an approximate problem. You prove existence of solutions for the approximate problem. The point of making the approximation is uh, hopefully that one is able to get existence for the approximate problems, something like a finite dimensional approximation uh, or an approximation which is an ODE on Banach spaces or something like that. Uh, then after you have solutions of your approximate problem, you prove an estimate for those which is uniform in the approximation parameter. Uh, usually with that estimate uniform in the approximation parameter, you're able to pass the limit as the approximation parameter vanishes. Uh, if you can pass the limit as the approximation parameter vanishes, then you want to prove that the limiting solution solves the original problem. Uh, and that would be an existence proof by the energy method. Uh, and then you can uh, get uniqueness in a similar fashion. Typically, you make similar estimates for uniqueness. Uh, so my results on this uh, do include uniqueness theorems. I won't have any more time than this uh, to talk about uniqueness, but there, there is a uniqueness result. Okay, so we start at the beginning of that, which is setting up some approximate problems. Uh, I'm going to use two approximation parameters, n and delta. Uh, I am, again, focusing on uh, the simplest case of data, which is that the payoff function just gives a prescribed terminal value function. So uh, w at time capital T would be some given wt. And then uh, I'm mollifying the data. I'm applying a mollifier. I'm calling it P delta to both mu naught and to WT. Uh, and P delta can be any reasonable uh, regularization operator. A good choice since we're on the torus is truncation of the Fourier series. So if you uh, truncate the Fourier series after, say, one over delta modes, uh, that gives a nice regularization of the data. So then the data would be infinitely smooth. Uh, then we set up an iterative scheme. So I'm going to have solutions. I'm going to have uh, unknowns W depending on N and delta, defined by W N plus 1 delta uh, is equal to minus Laplacian W N plus 1 delta. So I keep the same linear term at iterate N plus 1. And then the nonlinearity, uh, the Hamiltonian here in terms of mu and W has turned into the letter theta. And this P is the projection which removes the mean uh, coming from the definition of W. Uh, the the nonlinearity, so this version of the Hamiltonian, is in terms of the nth iterates, so mu n and w n. And then the same thing for mu. Uh, mu n plus 1 delta, uh, the time derivative of that, is equal to the Laplacian of mu n plus 1 delta. So the linear term is in terms of the, the latest iterate. And then the nonlinear term is all in terms of nth iterates. So all in terms of things known in the previous step of the iteration. And then to initialize, I take uh, the zeroth iterates w0 delta and mu0 delta to be 0. OK? Uh, so that's my approximate. Those are my approximate problems. And I said that the approximate problem should be easy to solve. Uh, we want to know that we have a solution of the approximate problems, and that's straightforward here because these are linear forced heat equations. Uh, the data is infinitely smooth because of the mollifier there. Uh, the solutions to linear forced heat equations, the solution definitely exists. Uh, it's also infinitely smooth, or if it's not infinitely smooth, then it's only limited by uh, the smoothness of the Hamiltonian. Uh, so if the Hamiltonian has some finite smoothness, then the solutions will inherit that. But generally, we can say that uh, I have in mind that the Hamiltonian uh, is infinitely smooth. And so then these solutions are infinitely smooth. OK, and if you want to be very specific, you can write down exactly what the iterates are, mu n plus 1 delta, 
uh, is given by the Duhamel formula applied to the nth iterates. So you have the semigroup applied to the data, uh, and then the, the Duhamel integral, you have the semigroup suitably arranged applied to uh, known, known quantities, so uh, things at the prior iterate. Uh, and similarly for W, uh, you have the you do the Duhamel formula backward in time. Uh, you have your terminal data WT, and then you have your su your semigroup suitably arranged uh, applied to things at the nth iterate. Okay, so that's the first uh, couple steps of the energy method. We introduce the approximate problem, and we have solved the approximate problem. Uh, the next step is the uniform estimate. So the uniform estimate is the heart of the matter, and I'm going to skip that for right now so that I spend most of the time at the end of the talk on that. Uh, for now, I'll just say what we do after we have the uniform estimate. Then we'll come back to the uniform estimate and spend a bit of time on it. So uh, if we have the uniform estimate, uh, what it's going to look like in this case, uh, here, these are Sobolev norms. I have the supremum in time uh, over the time interval 0 to t of mu n delta in the Sobolev space hs minus 1, say the square of that norm, uh, supremum over the time, the whole time horizon of W and delta in the Sobolev space HS squared. Uh, and then that was mu in HS minus one uh, at every time. Then I have mu in HS integrated in time and W in HS plus one integrated in time. So because these are solutions of heat equations, you expect the same... Uh, gain of regularity you get from the heat equation, which is one derivative integrated in time. Uh, it's the same gain of regularity you expect for, say, the Navier-Stokes equations. Uh, you know, you have you have uniform control over a certain norm, and then uh, L two in time control over uh, a norm that's one derivative more regular. Okay, so let's assume for now that I have. Uniform control over that, uniform meaning independent of n and delta. Okay, then what we have is a sequence uh, uniformly bounded in the space C0 T HS minus 1 cross HS. So for that, I'm just using the first two terms here, and I'm not using the, the gain of regularity. Okay, uh, Sobolev and Bounding tells us that the spatial derivatives are uniformly bounded then. You know, so we take S large enough, uh, and we'll see exactly how large I end up taking S, but we take S large enough, uh, then the first spatial derivatives are uniformly bounded. If you look at the evolution equations, uh, again, with S large enough, the first time derivatives are uniformly bounded also. So um, the sequence UN delta WN delta is actually C1 on space-time. Being C1 on space-time, tells me that we actually have an equicontinuous family. It's an equicontinuous family on a compact domain. Uh, we use our Zella Ascoli to get a uniformly convergent subsequence. And I should say, although I'm using a compactness method here to get uh, convergence of a subsequence, it really is for convenience. Uh, if I had a non-compact domain, uh, I could still take a limit um, just, doing, just showing that we have a Cauchy sequence by hand. But there's no need to do that here. I can uh, save a lot of estimates just using uh, using the fact that everything's bounded and the domain is compact. So I get uh, a convergent subsequence from Arzella Scoli, and that gives me convergence to a limit uh, mu w. Okay. Now Arzella Scoli gives you a continuous limit. Uh, we want the solution to be more than continuous. Uh, so the two things I have, I have at this point uniform convergence on a compact domain. Uh, that gives me convergence in C0 T H0 cross H0. I also have the uniform bound in the high norm. Uh, so I can put those two things together to get convergence of derivatives by using some Sobolev interpolation theorem. Uh, so combining convergence in the low norm and the uniform bound in the high norm, uh, we have the limit of our approximating sequence is in L infinity zero T HS minus one cross HS. So HS minus one cross HS, that's the space in which the initial and terminal data were in. 
the initial data being in HS minus one, terminal data being in HS. Uh, I also have the parabolic gain of regularity, so that I have my limit is in L2 of zero T uh, into HS cross HS plus one. So it's my parabolic gain of one derivative for both of the unknowns. And I get a little more than that. Uh, I get that the solution is continuous in time, except at the highest regularity. Uh, continuous in time in HS prime minus one cross HS prime for any S prime up to S. I tried for a while to get, to remove that restriction that S prime had to be less than S. I'm not convinced that it's not possible to get continuous in time in HS minus one cross HS, uh, but I, I at least was not able to do it. So it's possible that, uh, it's possible that the solution might be the tiniest bit more regular still. Okay, uh, so then to get the solution of the equation, we want to know the, you know, we, we took a limit of the approximate solutions uh, that doesn't tell us that it solves the original problem. And uh, concluding that is really just using the fundamental theorem of calculus uh, and uh, uniform, the, you know, basic theorem about uniform convergence implying convergence of integrals. Uh, so by the fundamental theorem of calculus, my mu n plus one, it's really mu n plus one delta, but I'm just not writing every delta. Uh, my approximation mu n plus one delta uh, equals its initial data plus the time integral of its time derivative. Same thing for w n plus one, it equals its terminal data plus the time integral of its time derivative. And then I have enough regularity to pass the limit in all of these. Mu n plus one converges to mu. P delta mu zero converges just to mu zero. Laplacian mu n plus one converges to Laplacian mu. And the time integral of that converges to the time integral of mu and so on. So we have enough regularity to converge the, uh, to, to do the convergence in these integrals. And then uh, when we pass the limit, we get these equations without the approximation parameters, then if I take the time derivative, because uh, everything is differentiable here with the time integral, if I take the time derivative, I see that mu w solves the mean field game system that it's supposed to, okay? And then I said uh, that I would say that a little bit more about the means. So that gets me a solution mu w to the mean field games uh, system, the, the slight reformulation that I did. We want to get mu instead. For mu, it's easy. We just add back m bar. We know m bar ahead of time. We know that that's the mean of m, and so I add it back. So m just equals mu plus m bar. Uh, we know that m is a probability measure from its equation. Uh, so you know its equation is positivity preserving and conserves mass, and so uh, that means that m bar was the the correct mean to add back to mu. Uh, mu had mean zero, uh, so the mean of m here is just m bar. Uh, and then for u, uh, we can determine its mean just by integrating the equation uh, both in space and in time. Uh, its equation is ut plus h of t x m du equals minus Laplacian u. Laplacian of u, of course, is diverg minus divergence of du. Uh, and what I determined from my solution procedure was w. And the important thing is that du just equals dw. So if I replace du here with dw, uh, I see that uh, ut is completely determined then by w. And to find the mean, I, I know the original mean, uh, I, I know, not original, uh, the terminal mean of u, and I know how the mean of u evolves. And so uh, we're able to, to then just solve and get u. Okay, so uh, here's the existence theorem that, that I prove. I say let t greater than zero and epsilon greater than zero be given. Let s be greater than the integer, floor, the integer ceiling of d plus five over two. I let mu naught be an hs minus one of the d-dimensional torus with m bar plus mu naught being a probability measure. I let ut and hs of the d-dimensional torus be given. I have two conditions, H1 and H2, which I need to be satisfied, which I'll tell you about uh, soon. Uh, then there exists a mu in L infinity, 
HS minus one intersect L2 of HS, and there's a U in L infinity of HS intersect L2 of HS plus one, such that M bar plus mu is a probability measure, such that U and M bar plus mu satisfies the mean field games PDE system with the appropriate boundary conditions. And I have my higher, my further regularity that you're continuous in time uh, in the way that we said. Uh, and let me just mention about payoff functions that, again, this is stated for the simplest version of the payoff function, but a result like this uh, holds with smoothing payoff functions in a fairly straightforward way, and also with non-smoothing payoff functions uh, that I'll talk about at the end. Okay, so I should tell you what the assumptions H1 and H2 are, and I will tell you uh, very particularly as we go on uh, but H1 is an assumption about boundedness of the Hamiltonian and its derivatives with respect to its arguments. So basically, it, the Hamiltonian just needs to be differentiable, uh, a bounded differentiable function with respect to its arguments. Uh, and H2 is the smallness constraint. So I said at the beginning that uh, since we're not using structure, we're just trying to say let the Hamiltonian H be basically a continuous function and its derivatives be continuous also. Uh, we don't expect, you don't expect existence of solutions for nonlinear PDE on arbitrary time intervals with arbitrary nonlinearities, right? So something has to give and we have some smallness constraint. So we'll, we'll detail what that smallness constraint is, but H2 is that smallness constraint. Okay. So, uh, the parts of the energy method that I showed so far are, are routine. The, the, that really, that is what the energy method is. The heart of the, ma the matter, the heart of the energy method is always doing the uniform estimate. So uh, that's what I want to talk about now. And I might not have time to do quite all my slides, so uh, some of it might be treated a little briefly. But the point is that we want to establish a bound independent of the approximation parameters n and delta for this quantity here. Okay. So my hypothesis H1 is just boundedness of the Hamiltonian. So uh, the Hamiltonian was H. Uh, I rewrote the Hamiltonian. H is in terms of the unknowns du and du and m. I rewrote it to be in terms of the modified unknowns m and w. So theta in terms of m and w is equal to h in terms of, uh, theta in terms of mu and w is equal to h in terms of m and u. Okay, so theta really is just the Hamiltonian. Uh, so what I want is that beta derivatives of theta, so s was my regularity index, for multi-indices of order up to s plus 2, I want d beta of theta in L infinity to be bounded by some function of, uh, of the arguments, say, of nu in L infinity and dy in L infinity, if nu and dy are placeholders. So I'm not differentiating here. I'm not differentiating nu and dy. I'm taking the, the function, which is the derivative of the Hamiltonian, and into that function, I'm plugging nu and dy. So there's no derivatives of nu or dy showing up here. Okay, so that's my that's my assumption h1. I want uh, some number of derivatives of the Hamiltonian to be bounded l infinity to l infinity. Okay, and then there's a consequence for that uh, if I do Sobolev norms of those derivatives. Uh, there's a function f naturally related to F tilde, that Sobolev norms of d beta theta uh, end up being bounded in terms of Sobolev norms of uh, mu and dw. Oh. Yeah. And there's a function F there. So F is, F is, re, is related to this F tilde. It, it's just a kind of bound for the Hamiltonian. Okay. Uh, so then we define our norms. Uh, the, the norm that I said we wanted to bound it had two parts. Uh, the first part was uniform in time. So S minus one derivatives of DW, so that's W in HS, and mu in HS minus one. Uh, 
uh, uniformly in time, supremum in time for those. Uh, and then the second part was uh, one more derivative uh, integrated in time. So here I have multi, ind multi indices alpha of order up to S applied to the gradient. So that's like an S plus one Sobolev norm. Uh, and here, uh, multi indices alpha of order up to S minus one with one more derivative applied to mu. So it's like an S norm. Uh, so those are integrated in time. Okay. Uh, so those are the norms we want to bound. I want to bound basically MN plus NN in a way that's independent of N. And these do depend on delta also, but I'm just suppressing that. I'm thinking of N as the main, the main approximation parameter, but there's nothing funny going on with delta. Okay. Okay, so what we do, uh, we have this uh, screen in tiny writing. Uh, I look at the kinds of things that make up those HS minus one norms. What makes up the HS minus one norm is things like multi indices of order up to S minus one applied to mu squared integrated over the torus. So if you take uh, that kind of quantity that I'm pointing at here and take its time derivative, you would substitute in the evolution equation for mu and you would get several integrals. Then after doing that, I've gone back and I've integrated the result in time. When you integrate the time derivative in time, uh, the next term, one term you get is, uh, is from the boundary condition, uh, so the data at time zero. So I have the alpha mu n plus one at time t minus the alpha mu n plus one at time zero. Uh, and then I get various terms from the evolution equation. Uh, here in the M evolution equation, uh, I have applied the divergence. You know, so we know that the M equation has a divergence in it. Uh, I have applied that divergence. Uh, and when the divergence hits the Hamiltonian, uh, you get various derivatives of the Hamiltonian. Uh, the divergence also does not need to hit the Hamiltonian. It can hit the M that multiplies the, the HP, uh, or you also get a term from the linear, the linear part. Okay? So the linear part, the Laplacian, uh, as, as happens customarily with parabolic problems, uh, that's a good term that comes over to the left-hand side. On the left-hand side, that forms the basis for my, my parabolic gain of regularity that I'm calling NN, N sub N. Okay, I think I only have a few minutes left, so I'm gonna go a little briefly here. Uh, basically, all these terms that come from the evolution equation, I need to estimate. Uh, that's from you, I need to estimate all the terms that come from W as well. The kind of thing that we get, uh, so for mu, I had terms on the right-hand side, one plus two plus three plus four. Uh, I use a number of applications of things like Sobolev embedding and Young's inequality. Uh, and I end up with uh, the kind of thing I'm trying to bound. So remember what I'm looking at here is the alpha derivative of mu in L2. So I get the alpha derivative of mu in L2 supremum in time uh, with some coefficient in front. Uh, and then I get a bunch of other things that I'm able to bound. Uh, th those things are in terms of the time horizon, uh, in terms of the, uh, the higher norm. It, so remember capital M is uh, the number of derivatives that I'm bounding. So from you that's S minus one, and then capital N is uh, parabolic gain, uh, where I would in this case have S derivatives, but integrated in time. So the norm that I'm estimating involves both MN and NN. Okay, and then I have these terms out front. Uh, I, if you remember from the very beginning, I put an epsilon in front of my Hamiltonian. That comes out front. I get the time horizon T out front. And I had this function F, which related to a bound for the Hamiltonian. I get f of mn squared out front, okay? Uh, so then you can rearrange this a few ways. Uh, I'll skip over this. Uh, you rearrange it a few ways. So David, uh, you have three minutes. To... 
Okay, thank you. Uh, we rearrange that a few ways. Uh, we sum over multi indices, we multiply, we use the boundary conditions. Uh, once we've gotten all this, we arrange and we get MN plus one plus four times NN plus one is bounded by the data, the data, and this collection of terms. So this gives me my smallness condition. I want that collection of stuff at the bottom that has the epsilon, the T, and the F out front. I want that to be small, basically. Uh, so I let this S be bigger than a multiple of the, of the data. So given some data, I take this script S to be bigger than it. And then I want this collection of terms to be smaller than S. So the reason for that is I can do an induction uh, where uh, I show by induction that for all n, I have mn plus 4nn is bounded by 2s. That would be my uniform bound. And uh, what it comes down to is if the data is bounded by s and the rest of the stuff is bounded by s, then that's my 2s that I'm looking for. So that's my smallness condition. And uh, of course, we want to understand the smallness condition. To understand the smallness condition, uh, I really want to look at the stuff out front. So I have an epsilon. Uh, if epsilon is small, then I can make everything be less than, I can make this combination be less than S. So given a Hamiltonian and, and some data, and given an arbitrarily large time horizon, if my epsilon is small, so that's like saying that the nonlinearity is small in, in a precise way, uh, then my smallness condition is satisfied. I don't have to take the Hamiltonian small in that way, though. Uh, if, the, if I want to think of epsilon as being one, uh, I'm given a Hamiltonian, I'm given some data, uh, you know, ignore the epsilon, then I can enforce this by taking capital T to be small. Okay? And for some Hamiltonians, I might have F of 2S being small also. Uh, I haven't tracked exactly how high, but if F were a high degree polynomial, uh, then you know, think if F were quadratic, uh, then F of 2S squared could go to zero faster than S. And uh, then that would say that for small data, for arbitrary time horizon, arbitrary epsilon, I could have the smallness condition satisfied. So my smallness constraint combines these different features of the problem, which could be small. The time horizon, the strength of coupling in the system, which is what I'm calling epsilon, and the size of the data. Okay, so uh, just very briefly, uh, I want to mention about non-smoothing payoff functions. Uh, there's a line, I mentioned this paper by Sarant, Gianni, and Minucci, uh, where they treated smoothing payoff functions. Uh, they address the case of non-smoothing payoff functions uh, with, the, with the sentence that the argument would, in, would need additional smallness of other data to be able to treat a non-smoothing payoff function. Uh, I absolutely agree with them that you need an additional smallness condition in the case of non-smoothing payoff function. Uh, and I go a further step and specify that additional smallness condition. And I can just point on the screen here. Uh, the problem is if U and M have the same regularity. So if you, because the terminal condition for U is that U is like M, saying that you have a non-smoothing payoff function says that U and M have to have the same regularity. I can't put U in HS and M in HS minus one anymore. Uh, if they have the same regularity, uh, this is a term in the, in the mu equation. It has second derivatives of W. Those second derivatives are a problem. I want mu and M to have, I, I want U and M to have the same regularity. I gain one derivative from the parabolic gain of regularity. These second derivatives are too much. Uh, I can deal with this with Young's inequality. When you use Young's inequality, usually you need, usually you introduce a small parameter. I can't use a small parameter because in my use of Young's inequality, I have two different things which I need to be small. So I need the coefficient in front of them to be small. What comes with that is mu plus m bar. I cannot take a probability measure to be small. Uh, what I'm left with is theta pi pj. So basically, I need theta pi pj to be small in the case of non-smoothing payoff functions. And that can be said in a precise way. Uh, your theta, your Hamiltonian has to be such that, and, and your data have to be such, such that 
theta PIPJ of your data is small and your time horizon is sufficiently small so that it stays small. Uh, so that's the kind of condition you get. Uh, I am out of time, so I'll just extremely briefly say that uh, I can recover a result. Uh, I mentioned that uh, Gomez and Vascanian uh, treated non-separable Hamiltonians with congestion. Uh, I can adapt uh, the proof that I just described to the case with congestion. In a problem with congestion, you have your M in the denominator. Uh, the straight, very straightforward way to adapt the proof that I just presented is to apply a cutoff function to that M in the denominator. When you apply that cutoff function, uh, you don't have to worry about M possibly being zero anymore. Uh, but then if you're only going for a short time, if your data is bounded away from zero and you only go for a short time, you stay bounded away from zero. So when you do that, your chi of M actually turns out after the fact just to equal M. Uh, so in a very straightforward way, uh, this result becomes a result uh, for problems with congestion. Uh, the last thing I want to say is that uh, I mentioned that problems arising in application may not be separable. Okay. An example is the household wealth, wealth model of Ashdu, Bura, Lazary, Leones, and Mall. Uh, it has various differences with the mean field game system that I just introduced such as the spatial domain being a semi-infinite strip and using degenerate, only having degenerate diffusion. Uh, those authors uh, proved existence of a stationary solution and left existence for the time-dependent problem open. Uh, although the existence theorem that I just described does not apply to that because of the differences in the domain and the diffusion and whatnot, uh, more or less the same method applies. So. Uh, Problems from application might not fit exactly into the typical mean field games PDE system that I described, but we can learn from having treated this system, uh, if you have a system with some differences from it, maybe we can still treat uh, that system. And so the method, the, the theorem, the theory I described here doesn't apply directly to the household wealth model, but uh, following similar lines, not exactly the same, but similar lines, uh, I've been able to provide the first existence theory for that time-dependent model. Uh, and I don't have time to discuss this, but my existence result actually becomes a non-existence result for, for that time-dependent problem uh, because they have a moment constraint that I'm able to show is not always satisfied. All right, so that's the end. Thanks.